opportunity to have Will Chamberlain back on the show, senior counsel at the Article 3 Project, to react to the news yesterday of the guilty verdicts. Will, thank you for being here. Thank you for returning, uh, especially here right on the top of the show. I want to give you the opportunity to just react. What happened yesterday? I mean, it's a stain on our criminal justice system. Uh, it's a very, very bad thing for the Republic more generally. Um, I think I and probably plenty of people sort of held out some hope that the jury would acquit, that there would be somebody with reason. You know, we're, we're so ingrained. It's so ingrained into us to have faith and respect for our criminal justice system that you think, no, this can't happen. There has somewhat one juror, you know, 12 angry men style will stand up for the president. Um, but that didn't happen. He was convicted. Um, and he was convicted of a non-crime and he was the, the trial never should have occurred. There were a slew of reversible errors that occurred. I mean, the they you notice that none of the um, news networks can meaningfully explain the theory here because it is inexplicable um, because they, they always want to talk about the hush money. But that is not the charged crime. The charged crime is falsification of business records due to. And the idea is that he misrecorded Trump, misrecorded the payoff on the NDA as a legal expense. I mean, there's so many, think about the problems with that first. Is that even false? If an NDA is legal enough. I mean, is, so is that, I think there, there's a reasonable case to say that's not even false. Two, why on earth would Trump be the person responsible for how that was categorized? He was the president of the United States at the time that those payments were made and recorded. He would not have been sitting there thinking, oh, hey, John, make sure when you go into, you know, QuickBooks or whatever, or whatever the accounting software the Trump organization used, make sure you record it in this particular way. And he would that he would be saying that and not letting his account handle it. And then that's just those specific problems. There's also the statute of limitations issues, the problems with how each of the individual there didn't have to be unanimity as to the unlawful means used, um, the lack of clarity in the jury instructions, the fact that there, the election law expert was not allowed to testify. I mean, you, you go down the list of things that were wrong with this trial. It's about as bad as it could be. And so I guess I'm ultimately not surprised that um, the jury came back with guilty verdicts, given how unbelievably unfair this trial was. But I'm still just incredibly disappointed uh, and you know, angry and 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 very much. I think that I don't know. I haven't been listening to your show, so I don't know what your viewers have been saying. But I suspect that my anger, I'm not the only one feeling angry. About no, this. I, I specifically said this yesterday. I was. <laughs> watching my son had a my son had a 14 year old son had a baseball game so i'm sitting i put myself away from the crowd yesterday so i could stay in tune and listen to the news as it was being reported and the reaction and everything and i was sitting there and i'm like you know i i've said the point a to point b here they need to get trump they'll do whatever they need to take to get trump to get to that point that's their goal so we really shouldn't on the whole the thirty thousand foot view we shouldn't be surprised that this guilty verdict is what they arrived at I'm a lot more pissed than I thought that I was going to be. And I was sitting there and I was kind of stewing in it going, this is this has created a, a, a white hot fire in me that I didn't really anticipate because I thought I had prepared myself for this. But I don't think I had. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it I didn't I'm also kind of reaff reassured by how angry everybody else is. And I think. I mean, I think it will ultimately backfire. And I wasn't necessarily confident of that maybe a year ago. You know, in general, I thought the lawfare was going to drag Trump down. But the, the interesting thing is it's the other cases. You know, if you had, if you had said before all this started, like, you know, obviously all the cases have serious problems and none of them should have been brought. But if you were to rank them in terms of the relative strength of the cases, I think everybody would have put this at the bottom. Yeah. Like everybody would have said, of all the indictments, like the, so all of which have ridiculous elements, this is easily the most ridiculous, easily the most absurd, easily the biggest abuse of the judicial process. And yet this is the only one they're going to get a conviction on because the other ones are held up um, by for a variety of reasons outside of this. And I think if you had said what will happen is Trump will get the only thing that will happen before the election is that Trump will get convicted of the most ridiculous and absurd charge that everyone normal sees as absurd and ridiculous. I think you'd realize like that's not actually bad for him in the election. Yeah. It's not like not, I think he'll yeah. it, it, it'll generate backlash and, and he'll be stronger for it. Yeah, not it, not politically bad. It, it, it is a, it is a black eye, though, for the country right now, the justice yes. system and all of the Americans right now who are looking and going, what did he do? I can't even explain what he did. How did the judge? put his finger on the balance the whole time like why would he do that it doesn't make sense to average americans and any time that you cross that rubicon of oh they can do this with the justice system 
what what tax paying voting American doesn't look at that and go, why wouldn't they do that to me if they come up with something about me that they don't like? If they could get away with it on the most high profile person in America, why wouldn't they try to get away with that against me? I mean, the, the only reason they wouldn't do it against you is because they don't have the time or energy to want to do it. But that's that's not that much of a protection. That's not very reassuring because it means if somebody you like ever becomes prominent enough that suddenly the regime does deem it worthy of their time and energy to put you on trial, that, you know, the protections that we all think we benefit from aren't really there. They just kind of evaporate. Mm. Uh, and it's it's sad to see. It's really it, and it's very distressing. And it's not just, you know, oh, I'm a taxpayer. But, you know, what about somebody who's thinking about joining the military? I mean, it's it's got to be distressing saying, well, what am I exactly am I fighting to preserve and defend? Where 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 is the Constitution here, guys? Or do, does it just not exist for the guy who represents half the country? Will Chamberlain with us right now, senior counsel at the Article three project. There's something really important that I think I'm, I'm holding it as my responsibility. I don't know if it's been given to me, but I'm taking it on is that what has happened has happened. We are now at a point in history where this is history. It's yesterday's news. And people listening to you right now need to ask themselves the question, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? How do we continue to fight for the Constitution, for an equal justice system? Um, What do we do next? We have to look forward. And I want to ask you specifically in this case, what happens next legally here? Because you have an expertise there that I certainly don't have. But I also want to ask you um, what encouragement you might have, because I do think we need to look for encouragement where we can find it for people who are very dismayed today, like you and myself. Okay, so I mean, what happens legally is sentencing. Sentencing is scheduled for July 11th, so Hmm. in about less than six weeks. Um, That will uh, be... I think, I, I mean, I know some people are saying that in the normal course, like if this were a normal sentencing, given these char- given these convictions, there would be no jail time. That said, I don't think it's right for anybody to, assume, you know, yeah. I saw somebody tweet out, let me stop you right there, right? <laughs> let me stop you right there because there's nothing, been nothing normal about this. There's been nothing normal about Judge Merchant's behavior. So if, if you're, you can't operate under the assumption that he won't abuse his discretion, you have to assume that he will abuse his discretion. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's some real risk that he will order Trump to jail. And then that the question becomes, can they stop that? That requires a little more knowledge of New York criminal procedure that I don't have. I'm not a, I'm not a New York lawyer and I'm not, I also don't practice criminal defense. So I'm sort of, mm. uh, you know, that, that we start with, I assume they'll, they'll try to appeal that if, if, if the judge sends him to prison, the legal team will find some way to appeal or stay that enforcement. Um, and then then the question is, will that succeed? That that so that's my sort of broad thirty thousand foot view, in terms of like what we can do about it. Well, one thing I can tell you is that if we do elect him president of the United States, this will go away. There's no circumstance where a state court will be able to, or a state judicial system will be able to hold the president of the United States in their jail. There would be obvious um, constitutional problems with that because the federal government is supreme to the state government. So you know. If, you know, if you're looking for like the most obvious and glaring solution, it's right there in everybody's faces. We need, he needs to win in November. We need to, we need to vote for him. We need to support his campaign. Yeah. Um, and that's, that is, that remains in the short term, the single best way to fight his lawfare. There will be others. Um, and, you know, and, but it's, it's pretty hard in a world where we lose the election in November, then things suddenly, the options don't, aren't great at all. They're, they're all pretty terrible. Yeah. Um, and also because high. then you have after the election, you'll likely have the other criminal cases also coming down the pipeline. Um, and and those are uh, many of those are still very, very tough for President Trump in a world where they go to trial, because, for example, I mean, there's there's the D.C. January 6 case, which will have, if it's possible, an even worse jury pool than the one that just convicted <laughs> President Trump in Manhattan. Yeah. If it's possible. I saw yeah. a slide on Fox News today and Alvin Bragg, I think it was this year has pled down like 2,917, I think is the number, 2,917 felonies to lower felonies, misdemeanors, or just simple violations. That Alvin Bragg, the George Soros-funded DA of Manhattan, the, the, the person who is supposed to help make sure that crime stays off the streets when their men and women in blue risk their lives to arrest the bad guys. Alvin Bragg is supposed to be the one who makes sure that they stay off the street and that New York City stays safe. Almost 3,000 
felonies that he has worked very hard to plead down. How do you compare that to what he did to Donald Trump? Well, I mean, he did the exact opposite, right? You know, norm, people would normally think that the criminal justice system is there to protect people's lives, liberty, and property, and to ensure that, you know, wrongdoers and violent criminals are put away. Um, but you have to understand the way that the radical left sees the criminal justice system. It's not a tool. To, it's not an institution there to protect average citizens. It's there to wield as a tool against their political opponents. So that's why basically the obligation of protecting the citizenry, they only do just as much of that as they can get away with. In basically, like they feel like, oh, well, if we don't prosecute murderers, well, then obviously we'll get kicked out of power. So we have to do some amount of murder prosecutions. But like where they can reduce criminal penalties, where they can non pro, you know, just refrain from prosecuting and all they will do so. But not when it comes to their political opponents, then it's the entire book is thrown at them, um, including in extreme novel interpretations of the law that have never been even tried before. Will Chamberlain with us with the Article three project. He's a senior counsel there. Last question before we let you go. You know, the, the idea that Joe Biden or his White House or whoever is running the White House is somehow coordinating what is taking place in this lawfare against Donald Trump. That's something that Donald Trump continues to assert. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how high up this coordination goes, if it exists, and uh, what kind of retribution is now honestly in play because the Democrats have said, we can get a guilty verdict in Manhattan with this guy, with this prosecutor. We can put our number three guy at the Department of Justice in charge of it. We can get a guilty verdict there. We saw the her report come out on Joe Biden and his documents case, and they literally wrote, we can't get a conviction in Washington, D.C. against Joe Biden. So we see how they are jury shopping and how they are able to politically affect outcomes through that process. Donald Trump becomes president uh, after winning the November election. He's going to have some options. What happens? Yeah, I mean, well, to answer your first question, I think it absolutely goes all the way to the top. Um, you know, Matthew Colangelo was the number three at the Biden DOJ. This is one of the most prestigious jobs any lawyer can have in the country uh, to be at working at the top of the Department of Justice. I mean, that's that's the way to think about it is the Department of Justice is the biggest law firm in the world. It has more lawyers employed at it and more lawyers doing legal work than any any other institution anywhere in the world. So if you're the number three at the DOJ, that's about as prestigious as it gets. It may not be prestigious in terms of I pay because you're, you're still a government employee. But I mean, the jobs you can get after being number three at DOJ, I mean, they're the best jobs in the country in terms of best legal jobs in the country in terms of compensation. Um, so, you know, nobody leaves that job to go be a line prosecutor in Manhattan unless there's like a political, you know, there's a lot, there's a good reason for it. And that's because the Biden White House wanted Matthew Colangelo to be that line prosecutor. Um, and as for what we're going to do to everybody else, I mean, the Rubicon's been crossed. Uh, I don't want to, and I, the left does not under, stop until they feel the pain of their own rules. That's something I think we've learned about the left. They will not stop until they feel the pain of their own, of their own rules. So, I mean, I suggested, you know, Ilhan Omar committed brazen immigration fraud, you know, when the Trump DOJ, if we get back in power in 2025, she'd be, she should be arrested and put in leg irons on the floor of the house, right? Just to make a point, like we are not, you know, we aren't playing anymore. If you're going to arrest and put our people on jail, we are going to arrest and humiliate your politicians if they commit any crimes at all, right? And, we're, and there's no more, no more norms, no more discretion, no more respecting, you know, your position. No, 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 no. You, you, if you're a Democrat and you've committed anything we can construe as a crime, you're going to jail and you're going to be publicly humiliated, mugshot included. I mean, they drew the battle lines. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's very heart-wrenching and conflicting to hear that. But I'm just asking myself legitimately what options are left other than we have to beat them at their own game. And I don't, I don't know what those options are. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it has to be done because I, I want to get back to a place where there's a settlement where we, we don't do this to each other. But Democrats have demonstrated they, they, aren't, they aren't respecting the norm anymore. They don't care. And we, the only way to get them to make them care is to under, make them understand why the norm was valuable in the first place. Will Chamberlain, we're very grateful for you. This is, I'm sure you're in high demand and we appreciate you made some time for our show here. We look forward to having you back. There's going to be lots to talk about, that's for sure. Of course. Thanks, Annie. Thank you so much. We appreciate you.